Welcome to the course on Scalable Data Science. I'm uh, Anirban from IIT Gandhinagar and uh, we are still talking about locality sensitive hashing. So today's topic is uh, data dependent uh, locality sensitive hashing. Again, uh, just to refresh your memory of, local of what locality sensitive hashing was, that uh, we were looking at this uh, particular framing of the nearest neighbor question that we are given a set of uh, data points x1 to xn. We are also given a query point q and, and our radius r. So what we have to return is the following, that if there is any point that is a distance 1 minus r, then you, your algorithm should return 1, that is a distance cr. So think of c as a small constant. So c is a small constant. So let's say 1 plus epsilon. Okay. And uh, your algorithm is a randomized one. So you're, so you're allowed to fail with probability delta, which means that with probability 1 minus delta, you must satisfy this guarantee. Uh, so the parameters of the, of the locality sensitive hashing are k and l and uh, if you remember the, uh, if you remember the algorithm, it was we chose for, for each hash table hi, we chose uh, k iid hash functions hi1 to hik and then we cr created and then we hashed the point x using hi1 to hik that gave us a k tuple and that k tuple is the, is the bucket id for the hash table hi okay so no so so before we even proceed something uh, so before we even proceed something should strike you that the choice of the hash functions has nothing to do with the data right it has to do with the distance metric that you promised to use right but it doesn't really sort of take into account the data itself this is completely oblivious to the data is this a good thing right so the rand, uh, what it does is that the basic intuition that the LSH brings is that we are creating a random partitioning of the data set. That, that if the data set lies, lies as follows, right, then, then, then each, each hash bucket HI can be thought of as building a random partition that we have already talked about before, right, that we are sort of uh, partitioning, okay. And the points in each of this partition go to one of the buckets in one of the hash tables. Each hash table is a separate random partitioning of the data also. So why is this useful? So this is really useful to guard against worst case data sets, right? And the guarantee that the way to interpret that the guarantee, uh, the guarantee that LSH brings is to say that what, however you design the data set, right? We can get sublinear query time, some n to the rows uh, query time by doing, by running this algorithm. Right with constant probability one minus delta. So 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 even for adversarially designed data sets, we can get sublinear query time. However, this is not to say that this is the that if you know something about the data set, if your data set is not adversary is not adversarially chosen, this is not necessarily the best algorithm to run. Right? I mean potentially I could try to exploit some property of the data set in order to create this random partitioning. Right? And this could possibly act and this could possibly perform better than the, uh, than the partitioning that LSH creates, right? For instance, assume, assume for instance that the points lie in Euclidean space, right? So let's say that the points are, are, are all lie in, the, in, this, in, this, in this particular ellipsoid, right? In this high dimensional ellipsoid. So what that means is that if you choose random directions and try to partition the data, Right? You might not be very successful for most of the directions, right? If the directions, if the random partitions, if the, if the random directions lie along, uh, I mean, lie along orthogonal to this, to this ellipsoid, more or less orthogonal to this ellipsoid, right? Then in, in those directions, right, if the, if you try to project along this vector, for instance, on this vector, right? Now on this vector, the points will be bunched up, right? Will be very bunched up. So then random partitioning, doesn't really, I mean, then doing this bucketing along this direction doesn't really work that well. It's not, I mean, because all distances, I mean, distance from, from here and here, right, distance between these two points, right, gets bunched up in a, in a, in a very, I mean, uh, points that are very far apart potentially come to, come very close, right? So basically, it sort of, uh, it doesn't, it, it, uh, so what it means is that practically what would happen is that for, is that, for a hash table that is created by projecting along 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 these directions, 
right? Only a small number of uh, hash buckets will contain all the data. So this is not really nice. Okay? So ideally, if I knew that my data has this particular structure, right, then I should exploit this and say that I should be choosing the, the partitioning along, I should be uh, choosing the projection vectors along these directions, not along vectors that are orthogonal to the subspace of the data, more or less orthogonal to the subspace of the data. Right? So, so how do we exploit this? So how do we formalize this? Right? So, so one way that this has been studied is to say that, is to look at LSH as a coding problem. In the sense that what are we doing? What we are doing is that we are taking these points in Euclidean space right? and we are assigning let us say binary codes to it. Right? So we could as well imagine the um, as well imagine the LSH indices to be assigning bits, right? I mean, in the case of the Euclidean LSH, HIQ HIQ was a was an index, but if we were taking sim hash for instance, then HIQ is something that is a, a binary value, zero or one or a plus one or minus one equivalently, right? So let's imagine that uh, that we are assigning binary codes, right? And what we want is that nearby points should get nearby codes. What does nearby mean? So the notion of nearby uh, uh, that, that, that is sort of valid in binary is that of Hamming distance. So just to recall what Hamming distance is, that suppose you have two, uh, two binary uh, values 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0 and 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, then the, uh, the Hamming distance between them is the number of positions, right? that they differ on, for instance, here, here, and here, right? So the Hamming distance is 3 between these two, between these two binary vectors, okay? So, so what we want is that points that are closer, let us say these two points, should have Hamming, Hamming uh, should have vectors that are close in Hamming distance, and points that are far apart, for instance, these two, right, should have vectors. Uh, bit vectors that are far apart in Hamming distance, right? And if I have this formulation, right, why not use the property of the input data set? Because the input data set is already with us, right? So then the question is that, can I try to find out such binary codes by solving an optimization problem, right? write down the optimization problem, let us see what are the properties of such a binary code that we want. Number one is fairly obvious that the binary code should be easily computable, right? Computing it, computing the binary code should not take, uh, I mean should not be very computationally expensive. Uh, secondly, it should preserve distances approximately. That is the entire sort of uh, property of LSH, right? So the, so the locality sensitive hashing uh, preserves locality. That is, it's sort of. Uh, I mean, we know that uh, uh, we know that the probability of collision, right? Which means that the probability of having the same smaller Hamming distance, right, is proportional to the distance between. Is proportional to the distance between the points. If the distance is small, probability of collision is high. If the distance is large, probability of collision is low. And lastly, it should also have a small number of bits because the number of bits directly translates into the number of buckets. Right? For instance, if I have uh, if I have k bits, that says that we need two to the k buckets, more or less. Right? So so the number of bits is uh, should be more or less small. What it what that also implies is that the bits need to be independent of each other. Right? For instance, if you take if you take one uh, I mean if you take uh, 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 I mean if you take projection directions that are this and this. Right? Let's say let's say v1 and v2. Right? So, so, and uh, you can imagine that projections of points along V1 is very sort of close to its projection on V2. So, V1 and V2, information theoretically, they capture the same information about the distance between two points. So, very similar information, right? So, so we don't want such vectors V1 and V2. We want them to be independent or uncorrelated to uh, with each other as much as possible, right? And also, it makes sense that we want the uh, we want the bits to be biased. Un unbiased, which means that for about 50% of the points there should be every bit, for about 50% of the points it should be plus 1 and about 50% of the points it should be minus 1. So plus 1, minus 1 or 0, 1. I will keep referring to both of them. 
So in order to do this, let us try to create an optimization problem. Right? And let us deal with a specific value of similarity. So this is called the Gaussian kernel. That supposing wij, supposing xi are points in Rd. Okay? So of course you could define a similarity by taking, let's say, the dot product between them. But here is a nicer uh, notion of similarity, which says that wij is defined as the first you take the distance between xi and xj, the L2 distance, right? And then you define the similarity as exp of minus xi minus xj whole squared by s. So this s is kind of like the radius, right? Of um, at which you are you are interested in in sort of considering similar points. What it means is that if xi and xj, if the if the if the distance between xi and xj, right, is more or less of the of the of the order of s, right, then this wij gets a, gets a high value, reasonably high value, right. If if x if the distance between xi and xj is much much bigger than let's say omega s, then wij gets quickly gets to be small. Right? Because this is the, let's say the, uh, I mean, if this is, if this is, let's say, some c times s, then wij gets to be exp of minus c, right? Which means that it decreases exponentially. Okay? So this is called the Gaussian kernel, and this, and let's take this notion of similarity between between points. Let's say that wy is the code word for point i, right? Which means that that uh, I mean, yi is the code word for point i, which means that yi is a bit vector let's say of of length k right so k is going to be fixed beforehand so then it's not very hard to see that yi minus yj the l2 norm square also equals the hamming distance between i and j okay so the average hamming distance between the points is now is the summation the uh, ij wij times yi minus j whole square okay so and each yi is is a is a bit vector of length k, and I say that we'll either denote them as, as as zero ones or it's for the optimization purposes it's easier to denote them as minus one and one so that's what we'll go with, uh, and each bit should be unbiased, right? What it means is that uh, let's say let's say k equal to three so so y one which is the bit vector for the uh, for the item one is plus one plus minus plus y two should be minus plus plus y3 plus minus plus minus and so on and yn so now if you if you add up the yi's for every coordinate these should sum up to 0 these should sum up to 0 for every coordinate k equal to 1 2 3 so this is k okay this is what this equation means the summation i yi is 0 right so this is, uh, 0 is really a length k as a vector of length k here now we also want the bits to be uncorrelated, right? Which means that what we want is that the uh, the yi transpose yi, the covariance matrix. You look at the covariance matrix of the bits, right? And that is identity. Okay. So and under these constraints, so so why did this come about? This came about because we don't want, let's say, that the ith bit, the k equal to one. And the uh, and the uh, and the second bit, let's say the the ith and the jth, the first and the second, to be copies of one another, right? So we want the dot product of these to be zero. Okay, and that's why the uh, and that's why the identity comes into the picture. So under these constraints, that the individual coordinates are independent of each other, and each coordinate is unbiased, right? I want to minimize this average Hamming distance. So why do I want to? Uh, so why do I want to minimize it? I want to minimize it, right? Because if you look at if you look at this quantity, right? I want the the wij's are fixed, right? So now, if a particular wij is high, which means that the similarity is high, I want yi to be close to yj, right? Because if the similarity of i and j is high, then I want yi and yj to be more or less similar to each other. The Hamming distance to be small. Right? And if the and if the wij is uh, is small, then I don't care so much whether y n and, and yj are, are are similar to each other. If the points are if the points are far if the 
if the points are far, not very similar to each other, right? So, and 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 these are the constraints that we have that we have written down the, before, right? So, can we solve this problem? So now we have written this down as, a, as an explicit optimization problem. Can we solve this? Right? Unfortunately, no. Although it might seem like that, the, uh, that, uh, that this lo starts looking like a convex programming problem, but, but this particular constraint is a combinatorial constraint, right? which means that, that this problem becomes very hard to solve. This can be formalized in this following way, that this problem is, even for k equal to 1, right? This is an NP-hard problem, right? So if you, re, uh, uh, if you don't remember what are NP-hard problems, NP-hard problems are problems that you can guess and verify the solution in polynomial time, but without resolving the question P equal to NP, you are not expected to get a algorithm for this, for an NP-hard problem, right? that sort of getting a polynomial time algorithm for this would be equivalent to solving the, I mean, would be equivalent to solving the p equal to np question. Okay. So, and uh, the corresponding np hard problem that we resolve, that we, that we use to show the, uh, to show that our problem is also np hard is this problem of, called graph partitioning, which is a problem in which we have, we have, uh, we are partitioning the set v of g into two sets a and b, right? So intuitively, because there is one bit here, this is the, the this is the uh, and that that particular bit is going to determine which which elements fall in A and which elements fall in B. Okay, so 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 what we'll uh, and uh, uh, and what we'll do is t what this graph partitioning problem says is that we have two sets A and B and we have we have the values. Uh, uh, can we try to partition the set of vertices into two sets A and B? Right, such that we minimize the edges crossing the cut. Okay, so normally, if I did not have this constraint, then this is an easy problem. But but under this constraint, that the that the size of the two sets have to be equal, right? Uh, this becomes an NP-hard problem called balance partitioning. Okay, now what I mean, if you want to show that uh, if you want to show that our problem is also NP-hard, right? You have to reduce this graph partitioning problem to our problem, right? And uh, while we are not going to go into the explicit reduction, the intuition is that you can model this graph partitioning problem as the optimization problem that we just saw, right? And the, the, the bit yi, because there is only one such bit right now, is going to tell us whether a bucket, whether a vertex should be put, whether a vertex or a point should be put in the set i or in the, uh, in the set a or in the set b. Right, and this optimization problem and this minimization problem is exactly our our objective function, exactly maps to our objective function within a factor, exactly maps to our objective function. So then, this in some sense uh, is exactly the problem that we are solving for k equal to one, and we and thus we don't hope to solve give a polynomial time algorithm for this. So what do we do in such setting? There's a standard trick, which is to say that we relax the problem. So what does relaxing mean? Relaxing basically means dropping some constraints, right? And the most obnoxious constraint that we had was the one that said that the yi's have to be in minus one, all of them have to be minus one or plus one, that each coordinate has to be minus one and one, right? So, so I haven't introduced this notation before, so I'm calling y the code matrix. So y is the matrix where every row, yi, right, is really the code for, or the, the, the binary code for the point i, for the for the data set, for the for the data point i, right? And so yi is of dimension n by k, n by k. Okay, it's much easier to write it this way. Uh, also, uh, uh, here I have defined the diagonal matrix D, uh, where dii is the is a summation j wij. So the matrix D minus w, right, is also known as the Laplacian matrix. But that is we don't need to go into that right now. Uh, so, so then, I mean, with these new definitions, we can uh, we can write down uh, the uh, our objective function, right, as the trace of this matrix y transpose d minus w times y. So, if you if you don't remember the tra uh, the definition of a trace, uh, the trace of a matrix is is really nothing but the sum of the diagonal elements, 
right. So, if you it, it takes only a, a little bit of algebra to say that if you calculate y transpose d minus w times y, you get exactly this objective function, okay. And uh, the other two constraints that we had before uh, boil down to saying that y transpose 1 equal to 0, right, and y transpose y is identity, okay. Because I mean that uh, that is exactly the matrix form of the two constraints that we had before, and we are dropping the constraint that uh, y's are in minus one one. So now the y's can contain real numbers. Okay. So now if we drop the constraint, this problem becomes surprisingly similar to what we to something that we have seen before, and it is the eigenvector problem, right? The above problem that we that is this particular problem is solved by taking y to be the smallest k eigenvectors of d minus w right except one with the value 0 so if you if you if you know anything about laplacian you know that if you know if i take the matrix d minus w right this is a positive semi definite matrix right so so all its eigenvalues are are greater than or equal to 0 it it does have a eigenvalue at at 0 which is given by the all ones eigenvector Right, and uh, uh, and and then and then everything else is 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 non-negative, right? In fact, strictly bigger than zero if if uh, under some connect under some simple constraints. Uh, okay, so so what we're going to do is that we're going to drop the eigenvector that is all ones, right? Because that doesn't have any meaning, and then we're going to take the next smallest k eigenvectors of d minus w, right? Uh, the next k k of them. And, and this will be my y, okay. So ideally, we could take this, but remember, we needed, finally we needed, uh, we needed uh, plus ones and minus ones, right. Now each of these eigenvectors, now because this is a positive semi-definite matrix, each of these eigenvectors, again, are orthogonal to each other, and therefore they're orthogonal to the all ones matrix, uh, to the all ones vector, which means that each of these eigenvectors satisfy, if y is an eigenvector, then if yi is the ith eigenvector, then yi satisfies yi transpose 1 equal to 0, which means that summation yi equal to 0, summation yi j, summation over all j is equal to 0, right? And this starts looking like the, this starts looking like the constraint that we had before, okay? So, so what we could do is that we could, we could uh, take these eigenvectors and we could threshold them, right? We could threshold them at 0. That any coordinate, if an eigenvector comes out to be, let's say, 0.8, minus 0 0.2, 0 0.7, uh, minus 0 0.9, and so on and so forth, then this is converted to 1, this is converted to 0, this is converted to 1, this is converted to 0, and so on and so forth, or, or, or 1 and minus 1. Let me go with 1 and minus 1s here. 1 and minus 1, plus 1, minus 1, and so on and so forth. So this is my quantized yi, okay? We could always do this, but this is a slight problem right, that what do we do when I get the query point, right, because the eigenvectors depend on the entire data set. Once the query point comes, that you have to recompute this entire thing, right, because the query point was not there in the, in the, in the data set when I computed the eigenvectors, so the eigenvectors change. But I don't want to do this, because that takes up a lot of query time. Okay. So, so then, then the paper by this and this and this was a uh, this entire formulation was by Year Weiss et al. So, what they said is that uh, they went about it in a very clever way. They said that let us imagine that the data points are that we have are really samples from some distribution, and the query is also a sample from that distribution. Okay. And what I'm really looking for is by using the uh, eigenvectors that I. Uh, that I calculate from the uh, from the from the query from the training set or from the or from the query points or from the data points that are given to me. Can I create eigenvectors or eigenfunctions of the underlying distribution, right? That these data points have been drawn from. Okay. So how do we do this? So so to do this is very hard if it's a general distribution. If I don't assume anything about what the distribution of the data points is, this is, this is a hard, this is not a trivial question. In fact, uh, I mean, some of you might have heard about it, but uh, we could try interpolating, we could try a method of interpolation of the eigenvectors to the query points, and this is known as Nystrom extension, right? But this is also computationally expensive. Yeah? So in fact, it's, it's as computationally expensive as doing, a, as doing a knife search itself, so we don't want to do this. 
So what we instead go about is to say that uh, we, we make a very simple assumption about, the, about what the data distribution is. We say that the data distribution is really just a product of uniform distributions. That is, what we say is that, let's say we are drawing the data distribution in 2D. We say that in 2D, if the data is 2D, it really comes from a product of two types of distributions. So it's, it, it lies between some, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a uniform distribution between some A and B on one of the axis and a uniform distribution uh, A1 and B1 on this axis and an uniform distribution between A2 and B2 on this, on this other axis. So it is uniform in this, in this rectangle A and B. Right? And I don't know what this rectangle is. But, the, uh, but uh, what we're going to assume is that the data is drawn uniformly from such a distribution, that is, each coordinate is independent, right? And, uh, and then it's, 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 there's a particular interval in which it lies independent, right? And so, and so, uh, and so I'm going to uh, try to uh, use the eigenvectors of the, uh, of the data points to figure out what the eigenvectors of this underlying, or eigenfunctions, really, of, the, of this underlying distribution are, okay? So one other sort of uh, uh, twist that we do is to say that, okay, fine, maybe these axes are not known. Maybe these axes are not the input axis, right? What we say, more accurately, is to, is that, that suppose, suppose the data uh, lies, is something like this, right? Then let me try to find out some axis, right, that first best fit, best fits the data. And in this axis, Along this axis, I assume that the data is uniformly distributed. So let me draw you a picture, first of all. Let, I'll, I'll, I'll draw you a picture. Uh, so for instance, if the data lies something like this, is something like this, right? Then what we do right, is, to, is to first find the axis, the main axis of this data, the two main axis of this data, which means the two eigenvectors of the, of the principal, principal directions. Right? And then we assume that the data is uniformly distributed along this axis and along this axis. Okay? And why is that useful? That is useful because going back, that as I was mentioning, that if we do have the uniform distribution right, in a particular, in, the, in, a, in R1, right, we can actually, as n tends to infinity, we can actually calculate the, the eigenfunctions, which are the limit of the eigenvectors as, as, as n tends to infinity for a particular distribution. So imagine that you, are, you have the uniform, uniform distribution in A to B and you keep on sampling, you keep on sampling these, uh, keep on sampling points from here, right? And then you look at the, you look at the, vec, uh, 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 you look at the corresponding eigenvector and you let that, uh, and, you, and you consider n tends to infinity. So that becomes a function, right, instead of a, instead of a vector a function for every point. And if the data distribution is uniform, we can actually write down the form of this function. And it takes a very simple form, actually. Right? For instance, if the, uh, uh, if the data was uniform in A to B, right? yeah, so the height of the data is 1 over B minus A, right? if the data is uniform, is drawn from the uniform distribution from A to B, then the eigenfunction for this, the kth eigenfunction for this, uh, is nothing but this particular expression, sine pi by 2, k pi, b minus a times x. Okay? So notice that it only depends on this interval b minus a, on the size of this interval b minus a, and nothing else. And the kth eigenvector value is, is this quantity. Okay? So, so, so here in this plot, I have drawn uh, the 2D, I mean, here, he, uh, here I, was, uh, uh, I was assuming that the points are drawn from uniform uh, in 1D. If the points are drawn in uniform from 2D, the eigenfunctions would look like this. This is kind of a heat map. Okay? So, so what we'll do is, a, uh, is then as follows. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned, that the input data is given and the target dim dimensionality is given. First, we find out the principal, the k principal axis of this. Okay? Uh, so these are the top k axis. So here k equal to 2. Okay? So, and then we find out the ai, bi for each axis, right? which are these two limits. And these, let's say, in these two limits in this direction and these two limits in this direction. Right? And the way you could find this out is, let's say, by, find, uh, by finding out the 5 percentile and the 95 percentile of the data in each of the dimensions. Right? So this gives me, and now we are assuming that the data along this dimension is uniformly distributed in this, in this region, A, I, B, I. Right? So now, along each of the directions, we create phi 1k to phi k x, phi 1x to phi k x. Right? This gives me k eigenvectors in each, uh, in each, in each direction. Right? 
and the corresponding eigenvalues lambda i1 to lambda ik. So, so that is a total of dk eigenvalues. So, we sort them and take the top k eigenvalues and the corresponding eigenvectors. So, from dk we go down to k. Okay. So now, so now I have, uh, and now, and now I have a bunch of uh, a bunch of directions and uh, and some and some eigenfunctions I've chosen in each of them. Right. So now, when the query point comes, we are going to project the query point on exactly those axes. We, I mean, and we're going to take the eigenfunctions that have been chosen, and we're going to just uh, plug in the the value of the query point, uh, the so the so the x of the query point. Yeah, right. Remember here here this phi k. Uh, this phi k function depends on x, so we plug in this value, and uh, and then we quantize it, and then we get the bit value of the query point for this direction, the kth bit value of the query point. Okay, uh, and uh, so this, so the algorithm in its essence is very simple. Right, uh, it just involves taking principal components and and then and then doing a very simple calculation. Uh, it turns out that this is surprisingly effective. So here is, uh, I mean, here is another uh, plot taken from from the from the paper in which they actually take a very a pretty large data set called a label me data set, and they compare naive LSH. So this is the naive LSH algorithm. This is the spectral hashing algorithm with only ten bits. This is uh, yet another machine learning algorithm, and we are plotting the number of bits versus uh, the versus in some sense uh, the uh, the the what fraction that if I take a Hamming distance of less Hamming distance of two, right? What are the good neighbors? That uh, that are captured, right? Within that actually fall within a Hamming distance of two. In some sense, we recall at two. Okay, uh, yeah, recall at two, and they and they uh, 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 and it shows that uh, the uh, uh, that the recall for spectral hashing is much much higher than that of LSH. They also show a bunch of anecdotal examples, uh, and uh, since. There has been a large literature on, on, on learning the hash codes rather than using random projections. And there are many different slightly variations, variations of the ways this has been formulated. Unfortunately, most, for most of them, theoretical guarantees are not available for such data dependent uh, versions of the LSH. Right? Uh, I mean, there are some recent papers that point to analysis techniques that bridge theory with practice. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and this is an interesting research direction. Uh, another issue is that the time to calculate projections is also higher, right? Because it takes a lot more time to calculate PCA uh, than to actually do random projections. But this is something that we'll also look at in the in the next in the next few lectures of the course. That how can we calculate PCA in a in a much more efficient manner? Uh, finally, the primary reference for this lecture is uh, spectral hashing. Is the spectral hashing paper by Weiss, Torolba, and Fergus. Uh, there's also a very uh, nice set of lecture notes. Uh, um, I mean, lecture notes come slides on on learning to hash. If you search for learning to hash uh, tutorial, and we'll also put this up on the on the on our course homepage. Uh, there's a very nice set of uh, pretty extensive survey. Okay, uh, and thank you. <laughs>